gives me great pleasure to introduce the 1989 edition of Soviet Military Power. Despite the dramatic changes occurring in the Soviet Union and President Gorbachev's declaration of benign intentions toward the Western democracies, Soviet military capabilities continue to constitute a major threat to our security. The Soviet Union confronts the United States and its allies with very large, modern, ground, sea, and air forces, and with formidable strategic and theater nuclear forces. With the publication of Soviet Military Power 1989, we provide an authoritative, up-to-date report on these forces. As summarized in this video report, Soviet Military Power examines the context within which change is occurring in the Soviet Union and the implications of such change for Soviet military capabilities and the military balance between East and West. On February 15, 1989, the last two battalions of over 115,000 troops crossed back into the Soviet Union from Afghanistan. This was just one of several highly public actions in the last year designed to foster a less threatening image of Soviet military power. Clearly, the far-reaching initiatives announced by the Soviets for domestic, foreign, and military policy, if carried out, would mark a significant departure from the past. Yet despite dramatic changes in the Soviet Union and its leadership's declaration of benign intentions, Soviet military capabilities, land, sea, and air, both strategic and theater, continue to constitute a major threat to Western security. Recent behavior gives some evidence of a less confrontational foreign policy, but promises of a radical transformation of East-West relations must be viewed with caution. Fundamental change in military capability is difficult to manage and slow to come about. The Soviet leadership has made proposals that could, if carried out, reduce the threat from Soviet military power. But the Soviet statements of good intentions will be confirmed only if and when they actually reduce significantly the size and alter the offensive character of their deployed forces. As the NATO heads of state have said, we can overlook neither the capabilities of the Warsaw Treaty countries for offensive military action, nor the potential hazards resulting from severe political strain and crisis. Recent initiatives demonstrate, to some extent, the Soviet Union's often proclaimed intention to be more businesslike and pragmatic in their relations with other nations, including the Western industrial nations. The USSR, under Gorbachev, has pursued a foreign policy aimed at expanding Soviet influence in a variety of countries, while discouraging confrontational behavior by its regional clients. In Asia, the Soviets are showing greater flexibility on regional issues, such as the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia. With the Sino-Soviet summit in May, they normalized relations with China and agreed to a withdrawal of most Soviet troops from Mongolia. They have increased the pace of diplomacy with the newer economic powers, like South Korea and the ASEAN nations, and are attempting to do so with Japan. In the Third World, the Soviets have ventured further into a mediator role in regional disputes. For example, Moscow is playing an important behind-the-scenes role in the agreement for the withdrawal of Cuban forces from Angola. In the Arab-Israeli conflict, Moscow is encouraging moderate voices in the PLO and expanded ties to Israel. At the same time, however, they have reassured Syria, Libya, and Iraq through continued arms sales that Soviet support has not diminished. Foreign policy initiatives with the West have been even more dramatic. In 1987, the US and USSR signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. The treaty called for the elimination of Soviet SS-20s, ground-launched cruise missiles, 
the SS-23s and scale boards, as well as the U.S. Pershing II's and Glickham's. The treaty entered into force in June 1988. Since then, approximately 200 SS-20 missiles have been destroyed, and all SS-23s and SS-12s moved to destruction facilities. In December 1988, the Soviets made unprecedented unilateral arms reduction announcements. Many of the announced reductions involved Soviet forces in Eastern Europe. Collectively, these foreign policy initiatives offer hope for a new, more positive period in East-West relations. By all our activities in favor of demilitarizing international relations, we wish to draw attention of the international community to yet another pressing problem. The problem of transition from the economy of armaments to the economy of disarmament. Is conversion of military production a realistic idea? I've already had occasion to speak about this. We think that, indeed, it is realistic. The potential transfer of resources from the military to the civilian sector is a significant part of the Soviets' announced efforts to revitalize their troubled economy. Like many Soviet reform plans, however, these plans face many obstacles. In January 1989, the General Secretary announced that the USSR's overall military budget will be cut by 14.2% in 1989-1990. Production of weapons and equipment will be reduced by 19.5%. Discrepancies exist, however, between the announced Soviet defense budget and the West's higher estimates of actual Soviet defense expenditures. While public statements have pledged reduced spending for the military, since 1985, Soviet spending on its military, land, sea, and air, has continued to grow. Spending is likely to remain sufficient to continue key force modernization programs. Even as reduction in military spending is debated, defense research and development grows. Military managers argue that scientific and technological innovation, essential to the development of future generations of Soviet weapon systems, is the most dynamic factor affecting the East-West military balance. Computers, robotics, Machine tools and electronics plants all will be given high priority for development in the coming years. With some military technologies, the Soviets will do more than catch up. They will try to move ahead of the West. Space is an example. Currently, the Soviets operate 50 types of space satellite systems. They also maintain a large stable of launch vehicles, including new SL-16s and SLX-17s, which give them tremendous capacity for placing space systems in orbit. The unmanned flight of the space shuttle Buran is an impressive technical achievement. As R&D funds continue to pour into the space program, new technologies will be found that have spin-off military applications. The West cannot react unilaterally to Soviet initiatives that are not yet implemented, or to proposals which, if implemented, can easily be reversed. The Soviet Union is still the world's largest military power. Their unilateral withdrawal of combat units in Eastern Europe only begins to reduce the disparity that exists between NATO and Warsaw Pact forces. Even as obsolete forces are being retired, newer, more sophisticated systems continue to be introduced. These systems employ new armor, optical systems, radar, laser rangefinders, and other upgrades. All this qualitatively improves the fighting capability of Soviet forces. The Soviets have developed the capability to conduct simultaneous independent operations in multiple regions around their borders. Their improved command, control, and communication systems are configured into a permanent peacetime command authority that can manage the demands of a multi-theater war. This decontamination team shows how, during exercises, Soviet units have enhanced their ability to protect themselves in a contaminated environment. Their capability to engage in chemical warfare is probably enhanced by this capacity for self-protection. The Soviets have acknowledged a chemical weapons stockpile of 50,000 tons, including munitions components. Soviet air forces are being improved with late-generation aircraft and weapons. 
advanced fighter interceptors such as the Su-27 Flanker and the MiG-31 Foxhound have improved avionics, longer range, and a look-down shoot-down capability against cruise missiles and other aircraft. The new MiG-29 Fulcrum is one of the Soviet Union's most important advanced fighters. Over 500 Fulcrums are now deployed with the Soviet Air Force. Other Warsaw Pact countries have started introducing the Fulcrum into their forces. The new fighter interceptors are further enhanced by new airborne warning and communications aircraft, such as the Mainstay, that direct wide area operations. The new Midas tanker greatly extends the range of all the Soviet fighters and bombers. The Hokum helicopter, now in flight testing, is designed for counter-air support against enemy helicopters. For battlefield fire support, the new Mi-28 Havoc helicopter will supplement and eventually replace the Hind. These new helicopters will be an integral element of Soviet combined warfare operations. Over the past four years, the Soviets have averaged 150,000 tons of combat ship production each year. Warships entering the fleet include guided missile destroyers of the Udaloy and Sovermeni classes, new cruisers of the Slava and Kirov classes, new carriers of the Kiev class, and new nuclear submarines of the Akula and the modified Yankee classes. The Baku, which joined the Soviet Northern Fleet in 1988, is the fourth of the 40,000-ton Kiev class carriers. With new advanced radars, it continues the revolutionary advances incorporated into each new unit. Work also continues on an entirely new class of aircraft carriers at the Nikolaev shipyard. The first unit of the 65,000-ton Tbilisi-class carriers may begin sea trials this year, while work continues on a second and third carrier. Unlike the Kiev class, Tbilisi-class carriers may not be limited to planes which are vertically launched. Aircraft like a new V-Stol fighter interceptor now in flight test and the Su-27 flanker are candidates for deployment on the Tbilisi-class carriers. These future carrier-launched fighter interceptors will provide the Soviets with a power projection and strike capability not now available with the Forger V-Stol interceptors and Helix ASW helicopter now on the Kiev class. A new Soviet submarine is launched roughly every 35 to 40 days. The Soviet general purpose submarine fleet is the largest in the world. New technology allows nuclear attack submarines like those of the Akula class to run more quietly, giving them a better chance to evade Western anti-submarine warfare systems. The most striking feature of Soviet military power today is the momentum of its modernization of offensive nuclear forces. There are new generations of intercontinental ballistic missiles, silo-based, road mobile, and rail mobile ICBMs with greater accuracy and greater survivability. The Soviets continue to roll out new Bear H and Blackjack manned strategic bombers, which serve as launch platforms for long-range nuclear-armed cruise missiles. Theater nuclear forces also are being modernized. The pact has replaced old and inaccurate frog systems with the advanced SS-21. Tactical nuclear capability was further maintained as SS-23 missiles, banned by the INF Treaty, were replaced with SCUDs. Nearly 10,000 152mm self-propelled and towed artillery pieces can fire nuclear rounds. Former Yankee-class ballistic missile submarines have been converted to Yankee Notch-class cruise missile submarines with nuclear armed cruise missiles. The Yankee Notch, along with the new Akula class, carries the 3,000-kilometer range SSN-21 cruise missile. Existing cruise missiles, Soviet bombers, and ballistic missiles can be used to compensate for intermediate-range missiles withdrawn under the INF Treaty. The Soviets continue to develop and deploy strategic offensive nuclear forces based on force requirement decisions made 10 to 20 years ago. The general pace of this modernization has not been affected by the ongoing national security policy debates under Gorbachev. Systems being deployed today are increasingly accurate and survivable. In the ICBM force, SS-18 silos are being converted to accept a newer follow-on, the SS-18 Mod 5. This is the core of the Soviet strategic rocket force. The Mod 5's capability, even under a START treaty, 
might allow the Soviets to convert only half of their SS-18 silos while eliminating the rest and still maintain sufficient SS-18s to cover their wartime requirements. Survivability is enhanced with the continued deployment of the road mobile SS-25 and the rail mobile SS-24 Mod 1. Both systems can be widely dispersed and easily concealed. By the mid-1990s, SS-24s and 25s may make up nearly half the Soviet ICBM force. As recently as 1983, most of the intercontinental bomber fleet delivered free-fall bombs. Bombers would have to penetrate U.S. airspace to attack. In 1984, the Soviets first deployed the Bear H strategic bomber. Today, AS-15 air-launched cruise missiles carried aboard the Bear H have a standoff range of 3,000 kilometers and can be launched outside U.S. borders. A still newer generation of supersonic manned strategic bombers has joined the USSR's nuclear arsenal. Fifteen of these new blackjack bombers have been produced and an operational wing is forming near Moscow. The bombers have a range of more than 14,000 kilometers, can perform high-altitude supersonic dashes and can attack using low-altitude penetration maneuvers. The blackjack can be armed with 12 AS-15s or 24 of the new AS-16 short-range attack missiles. These nuclear-armed air-to-surface missiles are carried in a rotary launcher and can be used against both theater and intercontinental targets. In 1988, the Soviets launched a sixth Delta IV ballistic missile submarine armed with the new SSN-23 missile. A sixth Typhoon-class ballistic missile submarine also was launched. An improved version of its SSN-20 missile will be tested soon. Each Delta IV and each Typhoon carries about 160 nuclear warheads. Both new missile systems have improved accuracy and warhead yield. The missile's increased range allows Delta and Typhoon patrols to remain close to or within Soviet home waters, thereby increasing their survivability. Within the context of change, there are opportunities to seek common ground with the Soviets. The United States and its allies should take advantage of the Soviets' current attitude toward reducing the threat of war and enhancing international stability. But a few facts should remind us that the Soviet military threat is still very much with us. Even if the Soviets completely eliminated the forces discussed in Gorbachev's 1988 UN speech, the Warsaw Pact would still outnumber NATO in tanks, artillery, and divisions by a ratio of over two to one. Despite talk of reduced budgets, Moscow spends an estimated 15 to 17 percent of its GNP on defense, while the U.S. spends less than 6 percent. While historically changes in military production rates occur gradually, the fact remains that under Gorbachev, Soviet military production as a whole remains roughly level to that of his recent predecessors. The Soviets have been modernizing their short-range nuclear forces for over a decade. Consequently, the Warsaw Pact now has a 16 to 1 advantage in short-range missiles over NATO. It is clear that despite the dramatic changes occurring in the Soviet Union and the leadership's declaration of benign intentions toward the Western democracies, Soviet military capabilities continue to constitute a major threat to Western security. While we encourage the evolution of the Soviet Union toward a more open society and one dedicated to peace, we cannot react unilaterally to Soviet initiatives that are not yet implemented or to proposals which, if implemented, can easily be reversed. For despite General Secretary Gorbachev's stated commitment to a defensive military doctrine, the Soviet Union continues upgrading its forces and improving its capabilities. Prudence, therefore, dictates that we maintain our defenses while we wait and see if Soviet capabilities are brought into line with its stated benign intentions. Our experience in this century has shown again and again that especially with totalitarian states, seemingly friendly relations can be changed quickly 
by the decisions of a few powerful individuals. By comparison, military capabilities change very slowly. Until we are able to see clearly what new security environment we are entering, maintaining our military strength and political resolve seems a small price to pay to preserve our security and our freedom.